nobody really knew who we were and customers were looking for every reason to say no we just didn't have any area where there could be a gap it may not be like ultra healthy but i mean you can't change it it's who i am a couple of years ago it uh maybe wasn't so cool it was maybe a little <laughs> bit uh crazy or, or even some might say stupid that funny named sport called pickleball what was it that sold you on taking that gamble early on i mean the, the best way for us to get the product out there was and that's the next step long term for diet and this Real quick, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. My goal is to share the lessons of these interviews with as many people as possible, and the show only grows if more people find out about it. So if you could just do me a quick, quick favor and think about how you found this episode and make sure to return the favor by telling someone else about it, sharing it, whatever that looks like, I would appreciate it so, so much because that can help me keep growing the show. And if you've gotten any value out of the podcast, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I do interviews like this every week with new and exciting professionals. So stay tuned to keep your career moving in the direction you want. Thanks. And let's get into this week's episode. My name is Michael Manglardi um, and I work for Diadem Sports. I've been with the company for four years now. I'm on our uh, executive team, uh, mainly focused in operations. But uh, like any good startup, we wear a lot of hats. And so uh, oh, yeah. I've, I've kind of had my hands on uh, all pieces of the business. Um, we specialize in uh, tennis and pickleball products uh, for anybody that doesn't live under a rock you know what pickleball is uh it's only the hottest sport in the country right now and uh you're probably hearing your grandparents talk about it you're probably hearing your colleagues talk about it and the only thing that's missing is you grab a paddle and get on court and start playing the story of diadem is uh, a really fun and, and interesting one that goes um way before the days of of pickleball and, and what's happening in the world right now and um so diadem started by two guys that were um, former professional tennis players. They both had played their entire life. Uh, then they got into coaching, uh, some high level coaching, as well as some, uh, like country club style of coaching. Um, and they were looking for the next thing. And they knew that they didn't want to be on the tennis court anymore playing or coaching, but tennis is what they knew and loved and, you know, had basically been what they had spent their entire life learning and working on up until that point. So um, they, they came up with uh, the idea of starting a tennis company. Um, and, and Evan Specht and AJ Bartlett are the two founders. They're both um, still involved in the business and uh, work really closely with me on um, everything from product development and, you know, global strategy all the way down to, you know, logistics and, you know, shipping and uh, the sales team and all that. So both of them are, are awesome guys. Uh, and they were the two that started the company. Uh, they actually came up with the idea back in uh, 2011 while they were on tour um, and they met each other playing tennis and started talking about how they could improve the tennis industry. Um, and so they spent a couple of years meeting with different factories, um, coming up with different products and what they settled on was tennis string. So the most um, or the least talked about product, probably the least sexy product in the tennis industry is what they decided to go into. Um, and what they were able to develop was a string that helped players generate more spin. And it was not a marketing story. There was no marketing department. It wasn't like, uh, you know, hey, we're going to tell everybody it makes you hit with more spin. This this string was actually better than a lot of the other op options out on the market. And so um, they spent a couple of years developing it. And eventually in 2015, they had a finished product called Solstice Power. And we still sell that string. It's still actually our top selling string. And they said, we're going to bring this to the market. So they launched that in 2015. Um, it was just one product, one SKU, one type of string, and it actually started to get some traction. So a lot of uh, junior players um, were starting to use the string. Um, and these were like top kids, you know, top 13, 14, 15 year olds that started seeing the diet and brand and, and using the string. And, you know, for the next three to four years, they had a really um, methodical and, and strategic rollout 
of the products. So after the first string was launched, they launched a couple other types of strings that played into different characteristics and different features. Um, after that, they were able to get into accessories and bags. Um, and then in 2018, uh, they launched the first ever Diadem tennis racket, uh, which is a really big step for the company. They weren't just this little string brand anymore. Although it was just the two of them, there wasn't any employees or team members. They now had a tennis racket. Um, in 2019, I met uh, the, the two founders, and that was when um, I started working with them, and uh, they brought on a, a partner in Jeff Roshman, who is uh, one of our investors and has, has been with the company since. And that was when the four of us decided to you know, really take this thing to the next level. They had built this cool foundational brand that had some really great products, um, and we were ready to take it more mainstream, more commercial, get it into more players' hands. And really what it was is to tell more people who Diadem was. At that point in time, and we use this example all the time, if you called 100 people in the tennis industry and asked if they knew who Diadem was, you might get, you know, eight to 10 of them that said like, oh, yeah, I've seen them before. I've seen the string. You know, I know a little bit about them, but it wasn't full blown market awareness just yet. And so um, that was what the four of us decided we were going to do. Um, and so it started just Evan, AJ, and myself doing the product development, doing the uh, data mining to find who we were going to sell to, calling the person to try to sell them some of these products, uh, tell them who Diadem was. I mean, we we make fun of it all the time because there are so many people that are like, Dia what? Dia, Dia who? What do you what do you do? I don't get it. I don't understand. And so fighting that battle. And then once we actually sold something, we'd have to run to the warehouse, put it in the box, tape it up, and then ship it out. And so we were doing all of those different things and and really start to get some traction. We were going after um, you know, a, a small group of customers that we would call like the racket junkies or the tennis nerds, like people that really understood product understood what made a product good or bad um, and didn't necessarily care about who was spending the most on marketing. They cared about what the product did when they used it. And that was mainly the the rackets and the strings at that time. So um, we started to, to generate a little bit of buzz. Um, in 2019, we launched our first tennis ball. Um, and that was a huge, huge landmark for the company because um, you know, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the tennis industry, but it's pretty much dominated by three brands. Um, and those are like your household names, your Wilsons, your Babolats, your heads. And then there's another like three, what I would call tier two brands that are definitely players in the market, maybe not as big as, as Wilson, but they still have a real market share. After that, it falls off completely. There's there's not many boutique startup tennis brands that exist. We are actually the only one, and, and I think we've grown a little bit past that boutique tag, um, but there's not a lot of brands that just pop up and say, we're going to make tennis equipment. And there's definitely no brands that pop up and say, we're going to make a tennis ball. It's a very difficult product to manufacture. There's very low margins. It's um, super uh, capital intensive because you're bringing in containers of these tennis balls at a time. Uh, and we decided to uh, take what some would call a risk in 2019 and, and launch our premier ball. Um, and that was where we noticed things were starting to change. Um, a tennis ball is a beautiful product because everybody that plays tennis needs it. It's not like a racket or a string. And so we were starting to have conversations with people that maybe wouldn't take our calls in the past because we had something that they could actually use, and that was a tennis ball. Um, so fast forward to uh, the early part of 2020, and we had enough confidence in sort of the infrastructure that we built that we decided to bring on uh, a couple of sales guys. So we hired um, two guys to uh, basically start our sales team, um, one of which is, is still with us. His name's Fabio. He's just an unbelievably cool and, and talented individual um, that, all right, We've got these products. We've learned the sales model. We've kind of figured it out through trial and error. We know who we want to target. Let's go out and sell. So this was February of 2020. And, uh, you know, those two guys had a, a great 
two to three weeks of calling customers and <laughs> starting to sell until uh, this thing called COVID happened and Ennis was shut down. Courts were locked, school programs were canceled, everybody was sent home. I said, go work from home, no tennis, no nothing. You know, we'll see what happens. We just need everybody to be healthy and safe and good, and then we'll figure out what we need to do. So what most of our competitors, and I think what most people did at that time was they were like, I'm gonna go work from home. I'm gonna go like watch some Netflix. I'm gonna go like pick up a new hobby and maybe I'll work a little bit, maybe I won't. And the five of us that we had at that point, you know, Evan, AJ, and myself, and then Fabio and, and the other sales guy we had brought on, we have no other option. We're going to work and we're going to figure out a way to make it happen. So obviously there was no tennis products to be sold at that time. Nobody was even stepping foot on court. But what we did is we contacted every one of our customers and every one of our hopeful customers and said, we know things aren't great right now. They're not good for us. They're not good for you, but we're here to help. And we know this will pass at some point. The world's going to open back up. We're going to go out and play tennis. And when we do, we would love for you to think of Diadem. And we'd love to be able to support you, Mr. or Mrs. Tennis Coach, or you pro shop at a facility, or you brick and mortar retail store. We would love to figure out how to partner together and get you the absolute best products we can get you and make sure it's easy, seamless, and, and you know not a pain for you to do that. So uh, sure enough, like we all knew, eventually, the world opened up a little bit, but one of the first things to open up was outdoor recreational activities. And tennis saw this explosive boom kind of in like the late summer, early fall of 2020. Uh, there were certain states that were open and tennis was something that people were really excited to do. And, and there was people that had never thought of playing tennis, but couldn't do anything else. So they go, well, what the heck? I'll guess I'll start playing tennis. And so we saw this, this kind of explosive growth in our industry. Um, and we had worked for the past several months to have relationships. So when we saw that growth, there was a demand for products. People started taking our calls. So like we were, the cold calls where people would say, die a who, die a what? Oh, you guys have tennis balls? I actually need those. How many can you get me? And the conversation changed entirely. At the same time, that was when a lot of the world was struggling with supply chain issues and stock and surge pricing on all different types of products from shoes to tennis equipment to, you know, eggs at the supermarket. So we were able to also capitalize on limited availability. We had tennis balls. A lot of other people did it. So there's only a couple guys you can get tennis balls from, and we're one of them. You know, your, your options are limited. So all through uh, the second half of 2020 and then going into the early part of 2021, we started to see this really uh, cool and exciting growth, not just for Diadem, but for the entire tennis industry. Um, and, and that gave us the fuel that we needed to you know, get past that COVID era um, and at the same time prepare for what was coming next, which uh, is that funny named sport called pickleball that people can't stop talking about. Um, and so in 2021, we had wrapped up the development process of our initial flagship pickleball paddle. And in the spring of 2021, we launched the icon paddle. Um, and that was our venture into this new sport, this new industry, this new territory that not a lot of people had really known much about, but we had been looking at it and talking about it. And it was in kind of our radar. You know, we knew that this sport was growing. Now, of course, we couldn't have accounted for what COVID did for pickleball, which is just took it to an entirely different you know, uh, world of growth. But we knew that it was coming and we knew that it had a, a lot of momentum. So um, from there, you know, we did what we do best and that's make really innovative, really cutting edge products, offer our customers, the absolute best service that we can. I mean, we've got a team of, of 10 full-time salespeople that are just making sure the customer experience is perfect every single day, figuring out how we can help, making sure if you need something, we're getting it on the UPS truck and getting it to you right away. 
um, and then making sure that we were putting together um, programs that worked for our customers. So if you needed um, uh, paddles to sell at your store, we were going to figure out a way to get you our paddles and make sure that you were going to have success selling those. If you were interested in tennis balls, that's where we were going to put our focus. But it was really about being kind of mobile and lean and being able to adapt at all of these other variables that were coming our way. And, you know, I'm sure you remember it and, and everybody else does. 2020 and 2021, things changed by the week. It wasn't like, oh, we have a six month or an eight month trend. It's like last month they told me I couldn't leave my apartment. This month I can maybe go play tennis and go to the supermarket. And then the next month you were back in the office. So things were just changing so fast. And, you know, a lot of bigger brands weren't able to move as, as quickly as we could. So, well, we use that as an opportunity to capitalize. And uh, since then it's been just explosive growth with the product line and, and the new products we've rolled out. Of course, the team that we've been able to build from when it was just the three of us or, or even the two founders and then myself joining later on uh, to the first couple of sales guys that we brought on to now a team where we've got, you know, a marketing department and accounting and sales and all of these new initiatives and ventures that we're splitting off into. Um, and, and we're really excited about the future, not just of tennis and pickleball, but the future of Diadem and, and what we plan to do within these industries. So, yeah, that's, that's where we are it. now. And uh, yeah, I'm sure there's still a couple more chapters yet to be written. Yeah, I think we'll get into a lot from there. Um, the biggest thing that came to mind as you were kind of setting all that up is you mentioned a few times the quality of the product. And so I something that came to mind as you were describing that, and especially when you're talking about how you didn't really have to market it as much at the beginning because the product was so quality, I think that's an important point is that if you make a good enough product, it does kind of market itself. So I'm curious to you, what are some of the general principles that go into creating a quality and a, an incredible product? Because that's one thing that along the, the course of your journey that you talked about, it sounds like Diadem has been able to consistently just create newer and more innovative, better and more quality products uh, across a couple different areas. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you you draw that uh, analysis because we kind of joke here at the office where it's almost the opposites. It's even if you made the absolute best product in the world, but nobody knew about it, it's going to go unsold. So we had to not only make a great product, but we also had to figure out how to market and sell it. Now, if you're an incredible salesperson or an incredible marketer, you're going to be able to get some sales, but if the product doesn't hold up, then you've got nothing. And so what we've always talked about is we just need to be giving customers every reason to say yes. We're going to call them. We're going to give them a great sales pitch. We're going to have beautiful marketing. We're going to do every everything we can to at least start that conversation. But we also have to make sure that on the back end, the product holds up and that once we've gotten that product into their hand, then we can have the confidence of, this product's going to sell itself. But um, for us as a smaller company, especially early on where nobody really knew who we were and customers were looking for every reason to say no, we just didn't have any area where there could be a gap. We couldn't make a product that looked bad. We couldn't make a product that played bad. And you definitely couldn't have a product that did neither of those. So um, we've always focused on making a great product first and then figuring out how to market and sell it. Um, what we do, and, and we've got an incredible uh, team uh, that works with our factories that's over in Asia and all around the world, is um, we are constantly looking at new materials, new combinations of materials, new construction methods, and just trying to identify how we can make a product like a tennis racket that's been around forever just a little bit better, you know, a little bit easier on the arm, a little bit more power, a little bit more spin. And of course you can't have it all, but we got to pick a few characteristics and really lean into that. And so, you know, all of our products are very different in that they fall into unique categories of balls and rackets and strings and apparel, but each of them are treated the same way where it's 
we want to take what's already out there and figure out how to make it just a little bit better. Because if we made it 10 times better, but it was also 10 times more expensive, well, then you also have a problem because you don't have any customers there to buy it. So it's taking um, what's possible from a manufacturing standpoint um, and being a little bit inventive with you know, how to how to execute. Um, and that's that's how we've gotten to this point. And that's something that uh, we hold very close to home. We're, we're never going to put product on the back burner and just say, well, we'll just spend $5 million on marketing and then it'll sell itself. That's just not who we are. We're going to make a great product that can perform and then figure out how to tell that story through marketing. How do you differentiate yourself as a small company without a ton of marketing spend, but the need, but still having the need to market the product well? How do you, what are some of the, uh, the inventive things that you had to do to differentiate the product from that kind of challenging place? On the, the sales side of things, or the sales marketing side, or on the actual product development side? The sales marketing side. So, yeah, three, four years ago, we had a, a $0 marketing budget, and, and fortunately, we've grown a little bit, and so now we can spend a little bit on you know, Facebook and Google ads and you know some partnerships and sponsorships, things like that. But early on, I mean, the, the best way for us to get the product out there was to cold call. I mean, like we were cold calling clubs and tennis shops and at home stringers, literally anybody that was in the business of tennis that would listen to us, we wanted to talk to. Um, Now, how did we actually sell the product? We sold it by letting them try it first. And so uh, something that a lot of our early customers experienced was before we asked them to buy anything from us, we'd say, hey, Brody, I got this product. I think you're going to love it. I think it's going to work for you and your clients. But before you tell me yes or no, can I send you a free sample? Let me send you one set of string, one can of balls, a demo racket, and you let it you know, speak for itself. You tell me what you think, and then if it works for you, which we think it will, let's figure out a way to work together. And if it doesn't, at least give me some feedback and we'll go back to the drawing board and, and figure out how we can improve. So you know, the marketing was really done through getting on the phone, we're getting on text messages or emails or however we could communicate and just asking people for their feedback on the product. Hey, can you give me your opinion on this racket, on this string, on this ball? And if you like it, let's work together. I love it. What, uh, going back to the time during COVID when you guys decided to double down and really go hard and power through that difficult time, what it, one question we talked about off air that I think kind of relates into this is I wanted to ask you, what do you think is your, your deepest driving force and how does, how has that played into the culture at Diadem? Because it sounds like there was something at play there just kind of in the culture between all of you that just kind of kept you guys, that took you guys in a different direction than most people were going and then your competitors were going there. What do you think that was? Yeah, I mean, early on, there was definitely a few similarities between all of us early employees or early partners, whatever you want to call it, that um, was a driving force. And that was, we're all athletes, we're all former athletes. Um, even though we like to play pickleball or tennis, we're, we're not as good as we once was. Um, but we're all athletes, we love to compete. And as much as we love to win, I think pretty much everybody at that time hated losing even more. And so we just couldn't stand the fact of somebody or the world or the industry was going to say, just go home and and sit this one out and let's see what happens. If a big established Goliath brand did that, they had to maybe do some layoffs. They maybe cut a couple budgets here and there, but they were going to be just fine. Otherwise, we didn't have that option. It was if we went home and shut things down, we were going to disappear. I mean, there's just, there, there was no other way around it. So uh, I think it was that hatred for, for losing that ultra, ultra competitive nature that each of us have. Um, and then it was also just, you know, our, our passion for what we were building. I mean, we, uh, especially the two founders, Evan and AJ, I mean, they spent 
years on this thing. It started as this idea in 2011, flash forward nine years, and they had gone from this idea to then a product to then actually selling to customers and expanding the product line. Um, we we love what we do. We loved what we were doing at the time. And I, I just don't think it's in any of our nature to sit at home and wait. You know, it's not who we are. I love it. Just coming out of a, a hatred for losing. I mean, sometimes... <laughs> Sometimes just avoiding the the pain is a driving force on it on its own. There, that's yeah, awesome. It, Any, it, it may not be like ultra healthy, but I mean, can't change it. It's who I am. It's uh, I think it's just a principle of coming out of that athletic background. Um, we had talked about that a little bit off air. How you were an athlete growing up. Any other parallels that you've seen in your career or just the business world at large that you think? kind of came from from growing up in that world and just learning those principles early on yeah the the competitive nature i think is the obvious one that anybody that's played sports at some level uh, whether it was as a, a little league baseball player all the way to a professional you know what it's like to compete and you either love to compete or you hate to compete um but that translates i think to, to business the other big thing is you know, the team element and tennis, it's not quite as relevant. I grew up playing team sports, so like football, basketball, that type of stuff. Um, and I think there's, there's so many parallels to a sports team or really any organization, whether you're, you know, in drama or theater or clubs or sports, you're used to working with a group of people that are all set out to accomplish some sort of goal that always translates to business. And kind of the beauty of teams is, everybody's going to have a different personality. Everybody's going to have different skill sets. Everybody's going to have different things that motivate them. But at the end of the day, you've got this goal that everybody's working towards. And if you can get all of these, these people to be on board with that and work together to hit that goal, I think um, the, the things that you're able to accomplish are, are pretty uh, remarkable. And that's where, you know, the team that we have here, I, I give everybody that works for us a ton of credit because, you know, especially early on, it, working with Diadem was a bit of a risk. We were a brand that wasn't established, that didn't have, you know, a big office or a big team or this, this infrastructure. And so, you know, if you wanted to work with Diadem, you were maybe taking a, a little bit of a, a gamble. And so um, now, you know, we want to see those risks or those people that you know, put in the time early on reap the rewards. And that's something that we, we definitely are working towards as we get bigger. As someone who came on uh, a few years into the company existing, what was it that sold you on taking that gamble with them? Yeah, I mean, the the two guys, Evan and AJ, are, are both uh, really talented individuals, which makes that that transition a lot easier, but they also made some unbelievable product. And, um, you know, when, when we got involved in 2019, there was a few people in my world and, and in our world that knew tennis that didn't have any affiliation to Diadem. And we asked them like, hey, try this product out, you know, let's, let's look at it, let's touch it, let's feel it, let's play with it. And the reviews were overwhelmingly positive. They're like, guys, this stuff is really good. And these guys are putting together some unbelievable product. And you're looking at an industry of, of tennis that is dominated by legacy brands, but is also a little bit fragmented in that if there's six brands or seven brands that own 100% of the market share, all you've got to do is get a little bit of each of those brands market share and you've got a decent business. So um, they had done a really good job of setting that foundation of who Diadem was, the products that we were going to make, and then also the organic brand that they had developed, you know, because they had been working with a lot of really good junior players. Diadem sort of had this brand image of being the young, up and coming, kind of like aggressive new brand in the space which is a lot easier to build off of than a brand that nobody's excited about. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something I wanted to kind of get into and cover a little bit is the uh, partnering with junior players. That's something that stood out when you were 
talking to us in class and telling us about the company and it, and some of the strategy. I think that was really brilliant because like you had mentioned before, there's all these legacy brands and typically it's going to be the legacy brands that are going for the the massive, really well-known tennis stars. And that's going to be very expensive. It's not necessarily something you can do as a, a lean startup. Um, what led into the decision to start targeting some of these kind of micro stars and how did that play out? How has that helped differentiate you? Yeah, one of the things that we always talk about as a brand is our goal to grow the game. You know, we've always said, let's grow the game of tennis, especially here in the U.S. And now it's let's grow the game of pickleball here in the U.S. Pickleball doesn't need that much help growing right now, but those have been you know two of the the things that we've really tried to stand by. And so I think partnering up with junior players is a very natural correlation. Like if you want to grow U.S. tennis, well, we don't need to worry about the pros that are already on TV. We don't need to worry about you know the guys that have been in the space for forty years. Let's figure out how to get young up and coming talented kids to really fall in love with the sport and fall in love with with diadem and our products and so that was where a lot of the early growth came from um, and now more recently that we have a full product line we've been able to um, build off of that junior roster so we've got hundreds of kids across the country and the goal is to work towards thousands of kids across the country that are using diadem and sponsored by diadem in some capacity and that might mean you're you know the top kid in the country you're going to guaranteed play d1 tennis and probably go on to play pro we'll sponsor you but also you might be the kid that's you know trying to make the jv tennis team at your high school and you play three other sports the rest of the year, but tennis is something that you've, you know, found and, and you like. And so we want to support that kid and, you know, we'll support them in different ways, um, but we still want those kids on the roster. We still want those kids playing tennis and working with Diadem. I love that. I think it's uh, I think it's really smart because if you're thinking about it on like a really macro level of the game of tennis and your goal of trying to grow the game of tennis, the, I don't necessarily think or see that happening through the big stars because I think most of the time it's going to be the people that are already into the game that are really watching the big stars. But on like a, a smaller kind of baseline entry level, it's going to be those like those lower level kind of earlier on stars that I think are getting their friends into the game, getting other people into the game. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense to me. That's yeah, interesting. you're a hundred percent right there. And, you know, from just a pure like marketing standpoint, if you have X amount of dollars to sponsor people, you can either get one top 50 pro or top 25 pro, maybe, you know, like maybe not depending on what that number is, or you could take that money and divide it across hundreds or maybe thousands of junior tennis players and of course you're not paying them but you're giving them product that correlates to the the monetary amount and now you've got this this army of kids that are all behind the brand and what you or or I might not realize is sure Roger Federer isn't using diadem but if the best 13 year old in Birmingham Alabama is using diadem don't you think the other 13 year olds and the other 12 year olds and the other 11 year olds in the Birmingham area are looking at that kid going, well, if he's the best in the state or he's the best in the city, I want to do what he's doing. I want to use the racket that he's using. Oh, he's with Diadem. That's pretty cool. How do I get on board with Diadem? And so you have these, you know, like you said, micro communities of, of people that are following a player that nobody in the rest of the country would even know about, but that player has impact. And, uh, we've we've seen that uh, that growth firsthand from a lot of the kids that we've worked with over the years. That's awesome. I think um, another thing that came to mind as you were kind of talking about it, you mentioned the goal of growing the game of tennis. What is another thing that you'd like to just give back to the industry? I mean, that's really the big picture goal is let's grow the games. If tennis and pickleball continue to grow, Diadem is going to be okay. If those sports both disappeared and cratered, 
you know, we don't have much of a business. So if we can grow the sports, we know we'll, we'll be okay. Um, on a more micro level, one of the things that uh, we want to provide is accessibility to play. And that could be through product, that could be through, you know, coaches or facilities or leagues, or that could be through actual courts that are available for kids to play. And so, you know, tennis is a, a great example because traditionally tennis is a expensive sport that is kind of falls under this um, stereotype for some people that isn't always the most welcoming or uh, inviting to new people. But if we can work with kids or even parents or even, you know, adults that just want to start playing for themselves, and give them access to product, be that helping person that says, you know, hey, your, your son or daughter wants to play, you know, tennis. Well, we've got this program for them on our dynasty team. We can set them up. We can help them with some equipment. That makes one less barrier for those kids to fall in love with the sport. And of course, it, this isn't just for the juniors. This applies to adults as well. Um, but the juniors is is a big priority for us. And that's where a lot of you know that sort of focus falls. Um, now on the pickleball side of things, sort of a, a similar deal where a problem that pickleball is facing right now is there's just not enough courts for the number of people that want to play. And so, you know, figuring out how to make organized play a little bit easier, um, having partner facilities, partner clubs, partner um, even like parks that we can send people to, to just give them that ability to go out play the game, fall in love with it, build that sense of community, uh, make friends, be healthy, be active, and and really all the other benefits that come with, with both of these sports. What are, on a totally different level, what are some of, um, so obviously you guys started pretty small and have grown since through different things that have happened. What are some of the challenges that have come with growing and scaling and just being kind of a different animal than than like the very, very lean just group of the four of you? Yeah, I think early on, everything was very small and everything was very doable yourself. You know, if like we wanted to sell more that week, that just meant we had to make more calls. We had to talk to more people. We had to, you know, get more product out there where now it's, it's definitely more of a big picture strategy. So like where are we going as a company? Where are we going as departments and teams within the company? And how do we ensure that the product is aligned with all of those goals? Um, an easy example to think about for that would be if we were one tenth of the size, we would be ordering one tenth of the product. That makes the quality control a whole lot easier. That makes the capital needed to buy that product a whole lot easier and everything's uh, much more um, manageable just kind of on the fly once you 10x that and you have more product more money going out more team members that are you know dependent on that product getting to our warehouse and then you know being able to be sold you have to just think um, and, and take things just a little bit slower i would say that we still react and, and can adapt to things pretty quickly um but it's definitely changed from where it was four years ago where, you know, if, if we didn't like something, we could just change it on the next order, phase that old product out. And now you've got a new product and you know, the show goes on. Yeah. Versus you maybe have a larger quantity now and you've got, if, if there's issues with it, you've got more ordered on the front end. You got to work through that. It makes sense. Um, what are some of the kind of non-negotiable principles that you guys keep in your culture that you think have allowed the company to continue being successful, even with the addition of new people? Well, something that I always look for when hiring is most importantly, you've got to be a good person. You know, you have to be somebody that's got a moral compass that has values, that has ethics. Um, that's the culture that we want. If you've got to show up somewhere 50, 60, 70 hours a week and work with a team, you don't have to be best friends with everybody, but you have to have a mutual respect and an understanding that they want what's best for you. They want what's best for the company. So that's that's a non-negotiable. The other one that um, we're really big on is just simply hard work. Um, that's something that you know is is ingrained in in each of us. 
um, that started early on. And, and we've continued to look for people that have that same sort of mentality where, you know, we've got a job to do, let's get it done. Um, there's no like, Hey, let's save it for Monday. If it's Friday and we got something we can get done, let's, let's go ahead and take care of it. So, you know, kind of that, that grittiness and that hardworking mentality. Um, and then really having some, some vision. Um, and that doesn't need to be like this grand idea of like, I know what I'm going to be doing five years from now and how this role is going to change and what the company's going to be doing. But if we're bringing somebody on for a specific role, which most of the time is a new role because we're growing. And so the person I'm hiring isn't coming in to replace somebody we fired or replace somebody that quit. It's like, hey, this is a new position that we need in our marketing department because we're bigger than we were last year. and We need extra help here. So having somebody that can look at a job and a department and a company and say, my efforts will be best served doing these sorts of activities, or I can get the most uh, return on my time by doing these sorts of activities is I think a really unique skill set that I think can be trained, but is also instinctual for, for some people um, that certainly helps us. And, and we've, we've got a really great team here. Um, that's, they, they deserve a lot of the credit for getting us to the point where we are today and, and where we're going to be tomorrow is that we've been able to uh, bring together a really talented group of individuals. One thing I was going to ask you earlier as you were talking about bringing on the salespeople, but I think applies more broadly than that because you've got a few different areas of the business at play. You mentioned the concept of that a lot of times it's a new role when you're bringing someone on. How do you know when it's time to bring someone on when it's a completely new role and it's not as black and white as we have three salespeople and we need to have five now? And it's not like a necessarily an outlined thing that you know exactly how it works in your company. How does that work? Yeah, I mean, there's no perfect answer to that. There's no like right or wrong answer. Um, I'm a very logical person. I, I like to think I just kind of look at a situation and, and say, does this make sense or does this not make sense? And, you know, at a certain point in time, you're missing out on X amount of revenue or X amount of, you know, customer satisfaction or, you know, um, accounting procedures where you're leaving a lot on the table by not having somebody there to solve that problem. Or if it's a problem that, me or somebody else on the management team has been solving previously, you know, are our skill sets better used elsewhere? And can we bring somebody that has that skill set in to fill that need? An example of that would be accounting. You know, we got to the point where AJ, myself, Evan, none of us are accountants. We needed an accountant. It's like, it didn't make sense for me to be doing some of the stuff that I was doing or for us to be Googling how to enter certain transactions. Let's bring on somebody who understands accounting and then we can put our efforts somewhere else. So, you know, we just look at what's on the table, what we're missing out on um, and, and how much positive that's going to bring to the company. Of course, the easy thing to say is let's hire a ton of people and we'll solve every problem and then we'll be good to go. But then you've got a big issue with cash flow and you know being able to afford all of those people. So it's been a, a little bit of a uh, juggling act for sure. Um, but we've put a lot of emphasis on building up our sales team early on because if you can sell product and you've got you know money coming in, it's a lot easier to fill the rest of the gaps from there. Yeah, absolutely. That, that seems like it kind of opens up the floodgates for bringing on all kinds of positions. It's solving for the cash flow problem. Exactly. What do you see as some of the next steps for Diadem that you're most excited about? We've got a ton of really exciting things planned for this year, and, and it's very soon for us. So um, we kind of can see it right there in front of us. We've got a really aggressive product launch schedule for the rest of this year, and then even going into uh, next year. We also have a really um, aggressive global expansion plan. So we have a great team over in Germany 
that runs our European business. We've got an awesome distributor in Japan. It's done a great job of getting Diadem over to uh, the Tokyo and, and really the entire Japanese market. Um, and we've got a, a lot of really promising uh, distributors and global partners throughout the rest of the world. So that's gonna be a big step for us, especially with the tennis business. Um, and then here in the US, we're working on um, a couple of other initiatives that are going to allow players easier access to the sports, both in the form of uh, technology and software, along with um, an actual place that people can go to uh, to play these sports. And so I'm intentionally being a little bit vague here. I can't give away all the secrets. Um, but we've got some really fun stuff planned for the rest of the year on the product side and, and talking about the sports that we're in. Um, we are in the later stages of footwear development. So that'll be a huge launch for us as we get into the court shoe part of the business. Um, and then we've got a few new racket categories that we're going to be rolling out over the next 12 to 18 months that allow us to hit different types of players because our line right now is pretty tight for the tennis equipment. We're focused on a few certain categories of players, um, but with some of the developments that we have in the works, we believe we'll be able to target every single tennis player, not just certain types. I love it. It sounds like just a lot of stuff that's going to help you keep staying ahead of the competition and being like that much newer, that much more innovative and, and also just appealing to a broader audience. What do you see as some of the, the biggest challenges that you have coming up in the company, in in your particular day-to-day -day operations? What are some of the biggest challenges that you see coming and how are you preparing to face those? Yeah, so it goes kind of hand in hand with um, your last point and what we just talked about and that's you know, the future of Diadem. Up to this point, we've uh, gotten this, this reputation as the new up and coming, innovator kind of doing things differently shaking up the industry a little bit but at a certain point that switch needs to flip and we need to be the leader in our industries and that's the next step long term for diadem is we're not the new young up and coming brand anymore but we are a leader in innovation and uh, product for both tennis and pickleball and so uh, that's definitely a, a big challenge. We feel like it's a challenge we're, we're completely prepared for, and uh, we've put in, you know, the time and energy to, uh, to get through that. But I think, you know, looking ahead at what's to come, that's where Diadem needs to go. Um, it needs to be the leader of pickleball, the leader of tennis, and um, being a pioneer for innovation in those sports. I love that. I think there's an important point in there that applies to growing any business and it's that you you kind of have to understand and know and prepare for the fact that what gets you from a to b is not going to necessarily get you from b to c or c to d and so on it's the game changes as you go along ideally if you're doing it right and you've got to be adaptable uh, i think that that culture of innovation is the perfect way to prepare for that though it, it sounds like it's going to set you up nicely for that. Yeah, I mean, the product's going to continue to perform and it's going to continue to be cutting edge. Um, but like you said, you know, we didn't need a top 50 pro player to get from where we were in 2015 to where we are now, but to go from where we are now to being a top five tennis brand, you do need a top 100 or top 50 pro that's using your product. That's something that translates across all countries, across all customer bases. And so that's uh, that's something we're, we're very aware of. We're not naive to that. It, it wasn't necessary to get us to today, but it is necessary to eventually go where we want to be. Yeah, absolutely. It's just uh, the, the challenges change as you go on. So uh, I have a couple questions that I like to ask towards the end of any interview that I think kind of help summarize a lot of what's happened in your career so far and also talk about just the way you see things. Um, the first question I have for you is just if you could go 
back in time, take a time machine back to when you first were joining Diadem, just talk to a younger Michael, having the wisdom and the knowledge that you have today, having done everything you've done, what are a couple of things that you would tell him to do differently? I mean, as far as like doing things differently, um, I, I'm not somebody that's like a, a big Monday morning quarterback. Like I'm not a big, you know, regrets type of person. Um, but what I would say is, you know, stay the course, right? Keep focused, keep working hard, keep grinding because um, it does pay off in the end. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily pay off in that we're, you know, this massive giant company, but we can see where we've gotten to and we can see what's ahead it's it's not uh like this fairy tale to be a real competitor in the space which you know four or five years ago if you said that maybe people would have thought like yeah there's no chance you know knowing what happened with covid and then pickleball and you know all of these things that have happened along the way i think you got to stay the course i think you have to um be uh, focused but also aware of what's going on around you you can't be so focused that you miss opportunities um similar to like what we did with with pickleball i mean we were focused on growing the tennis business and growing the u.s part of the diet and brand but in the sideline you had this thing called pickleball that we knew was coming so you know if, if we were full blinders we would have missed that um so it's it's just you know staying focused but also seeing what's around you and um picking up on on opportunities as they present themselves I love it. What is the biggest thing that people get wrong about what you do? And why do you think that is? The biggest thing that people always get wrong about the tennis business is they think you need a pro player. Like they, they, if you just spend more money on marketing, everything else works out. And that's just not the, the case. I mean, really what drives a business is sales personal connection and uh, in communication with your customers. You know, we could throw a, a billboard off of 95 that has the diadem logo big as can be. And you'd probably talk to somebody that drives by it every day and, and they wouldn't even know it was there. I mean, I do it all the time. Somebody's like, Oh yeah, there's a billboard for the new restaurant on 95. It's been there for six months and I didn't even notice it. And so marketing I think is, is a necessity for every business, every brand, but I think especially younger brands and newer companies uh, put too much weight and unfortunately spend too much money in marketing when the real way to grow a brand is to talk to your customers, to figure out their pain points um, and, and to offer them a solution. You know, is the solution a better product? Is the solution a better price? Or is the solution, I'm just going to serve you better than our competitors? You text me on a Saturday night asking for a case of tennis balls to be shipped out first thing Monday morning. Let me text you back Saturday night and say, Brody, no problem. I'll take care of it. I'll put it on the truck personally versus the guy that waits till Monday afternoon. They get back in the office. They take a nice long lunch. And next thing you know, that order doesn't go through till Tuesday morning, which means the warehouse doesn't ship it till Tuesday afternoon, which means FedEx didn't pick it up till Wednesday morning. We just gained three days on our competitor by being the guys that are going to respond and take care of our customers right away. I think that's a really good principle of customer service across anything is just rapid response, speed of, you know, having kind of a, um, a sense of urgency in helping the customer is going to take you a long way. In today's world of everything being automated, everything being a you know chatbot response, people are are really uh, refreshed and shocked if they get a personalized response like, "Hey Brody, hope you're enjoying your Saturday, man. Have an extra beer for me tonight, and uh, we'll make sure you're all squared away Monday morning." Like, what? Did, is that a real guy that just texted me back? That wasn't like a a support bot. I, I think that's. Uh, a little bit of a lost art for sure. And that's something we take a lot of pride in is our sales team and our marketing team. We're, we're responsive. You know, we're going to do everything we can to give you a real well thought out answer to whatever you're asking. Even if that's, Hey, I can't help you right now, but I got your text. Let's take care of it Monday. Um, you know, so that's, that's a really important principle to us. And as you get bigger and you have more 
questions and unfortunately more complaints, it becomes a little bit more challenging, but uh, we, we do our best on that. Yeah, people crave that personal communication and, and good, strong communication and and those relationships. And it sounds like those relationships are would have taken you to the level that you're at. Yeah, people want to know that you care, just like, you know, I want to know that you care about this conversation. You want to know that I care. I mean, and it's something that you can sense, right? You can feel when somebody cares about what you're saying and what you're doing. Um, and, and that's what we look for, especially with the, the, the customer facing individuals that we hire. Do they care? You know, do they care about what's going on? Um, and, and that's something that's, I think, very obvious and, and you can feel it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you just it's it's something that stands out in, like you said, in a marketplace full of chat bots and lack of person personability. It, it does stand out and. I mean, that's many times the difference maker when there's a lot of competitors or a lot of alternatives in the market. We tell people all the time, and if, if you're watching this video, I, I can even challenge you to this. We say, and I won't name any specific company names, but look up one of our competitors and maybe go to their website, see if you can find a number, you know, and if you can find a phone number, try giving them a call and see if they pick up, you know, it, it just doesn't exist. And it's not just in tennis and pickleball, it's, it's in everything, like there's, there's no customer service line. It's a customer service email or a you know drop down field that you enter. With us, we want to be able to take every call. We want to be able to talk to our customers that have complaints, questions, praise, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, we want to talk to them and, and have that personal connection. So uh, if you're sitting at home and you're you're bored and you want to see uh, if you can get somebody on the phone, go do a little bit of googling and let me know what you find out. Yeah, it's a that's a an epidemic. I would say the worst thing is when you have some kind of customer service issue that you want solved, and you go to a website for the company, and you see that they're they literally have this intricate page that tries to just get you from one step to the next until you give up on trying to solve your problem. It it seems like there's a lot of that now, and it's nice to see the opposite whenever you can. We try our best, but I think part of the difficulties that they create is it's almost intentional. It's like if you yeah. if you want to return the headset that you just bought, they're going to make it a little bit harder for you because they don't want to take that return where you call us up. You've got an issue. We're going to do our best to, to take care of it or at the very least be fair about what we're doing. I love it. One other question I have for you to kind of close things out here. The show is called Profession Session, obviously. What I really like to do as the aim of the show is try to answer just on a, a really high level, what does it mean to be a professional? So my question for you is, what does it mean to be a professional to you personally? Uh, to be a professional to me, yeah, that's a great question and probably should have uh, yeah, thought that one through given the name of your show. But I think the first thing that comes to mind is professional is somebody that you know has success in whatever it is you're a professional basketball player you're the best basketball player in the world you know you're a professional singer you're probably a pretty good singer um and i think we can take a lot of that to the business world if you're a professional salesperson you should be the best salesperson out there and so um what what does that lead to in turn i think being able to financially do whatever it is you want to do and to have some personal fulfillment. Those are like the two key elements that I look at in jobs, professions, careers. And, you know, some people want to become ultra, ultra wealthy and, you know, have multi-million dollar mansions and, and yachts. And other people want to be able to, you know, take a long weekend vacation or get avocado on their Chipotle bowl. Like whatever your goals are, you want to be so good at your job you want to be such a professional that you can reach those goals and you also want to have some element of fulfillment um i think you know passion is is maybe an overused word in a little bit of today's business world because you know if your passion is to you know drink bud lights and sit on the beach it's going to be hard to be able to make a living chasing that passion but if you can find fulfillment out of what you're doing then that's going to be able to give you, you know, that energy, that excitement, that passion for the 
job that you have each day. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, the thing that you love doing the most, but it has to be something that you get some personal reward out of. I really like that answer. And I actually, surprisingly enough, don't think anyone's ever touched on the personal fulfillment aspect of that. And I think that is very important. I'd actually like to kind of double click on both of those points and ask you personally, what does having success mean to you personally? Um, I mean, success to me would be those two things. So being able to do what I want to do financially and being able to leave the office each day feeling like I did something of value, you know, and, and did something of importance. Of course, specific to Diadem, you know, success for me would be being a top five global tennis brand and being a top three global pickleball brand. You know, those are my goals for where I want to see Diadem go. And everything that we are doing is in preparation to reach those goals. So, um, once Diadem's done both of those things and I can check that box of success, then we'll figure out what's next. Maybe it's, you know, we want to be, you know, number one, maybe it's, we want to get into golf or maybe we want to get into, you know, podcasting and, and doing shows who knows what it'll be. But at this point in time, that's what I would love to see out of the brand. Yeah. So it sounds like those two things, um, the personal fulfillment side, you mentioned, leaving the office, feeling like you did something of value, anything that you would add to kind of what it means to have personal fulfillment? Yeah, I'm a little bit spoiled in my answer because most people like me that grew up playing sports say, I would love to be able to work in the sports industry. I get it. It's very cool. It's very fun. And, and I'm appreciative of that opportunity each day. Um, so, you know, that makes the fulfillment a little bit easier because it's it's cool you know it's just it's fun but the part of building a business which has kind of been another uh interest of mine from even back when i was in school and then early in my career i loved the concept and the the action of building things and so to be able to have all of these problems and challenges and and issues that that come up every single day and being able to navigate them and solve them and and maybe in some cases not solve them right away, um, makes each day, you know, a bit of a, a challenge, but it's a fun and rewarding challenge because, you know, we can look back month over month, year over year and say like, Hey, this is, this is pretty special what we're building. Um, and at the same time, getting awesome, talented, motivated individuals to join us on that ride has been really cool. And, you know, the guy that I referenced in the very beginning of this uh, meeting, Fabio, you know, he was the first sales guy that took a risk to come and work with us. You know, now he just finished up March. He was our top salesman. He's, you know, got some of the biggest accounts in the country. He's doing numbers that he and I wouldn't have dreamt of three years ago. And it's very cool to see somebody that puts in the work, puts in the effort, makes the commitment, be able to come out at the other end and see all of those those rewards. So that part gives me a, a lot of fulfillment and, and makes you know all of this uh, a really fun venture to be on. That's awesome. I love just the idea of building awesome things. I think no matter, just as a note to the audience, no matter what you're doing, I think you can find a lot of fulfillment in just building something, whether it's your side hustle, whether it's exists in your current career. I think there's just so much fulfillment in that. Yeah. And it doesn't have to necessarily be sexy either. Like, you know, a lot of people would want to start a business in something that they think is, is sexy or fun or is a personal hobby of theirs. But, you know, if, if we were in a different business and it wasn't tennis and pickleball, you know, we'd still be grinding away at it. And we'd still be coming up with cool ways to innovate and do things differently know for for a lot of the people here and i'm assuming a lot of your audience the fun comes from that building process you know that problem solving and, and obstacles and seeing the growth and seeing the setbacks you know it doesn't really matter what the product or the service is it's it's the steps you're taking to get wherever you want to go i 100 percent agree 
Well, Michael, thank you so much for coming on and telling your story. Uh, anything else that you would want to kind of share with the audience? Any closing thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I really appreciate your time, Brody. And uh, again, kudos to you for the, the great work that you're putting in on this platform, but also the other things that you're doing outside of, of this platform. So really appreciate you thinking of me and thinking of Diadem um, and, and to the people that are uh, watching and have stuck around to watch the rest of this video. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, if you're thinking about starting a business or you've started a business, keep grinding, keep working hard, keep pushing. If you want to connect with me, would love to uh, to chat with you and you know pick your brain and learn from you. Um, and if you're not interested in starting a business, but you love tennis or pickleball, then hopefully you know what brand you should be looking towards and uh, check us out on social media or, or visit our website and uh, you know, let me know if you watched this, send me a message on LinkedIn and uh, we'll see what we can do about hopefully getting you some products to try out. I love it. And I'll make sure that you can find Michael and also all of Diadem's accounts in the show notes if you're listening on audio or the description if you're watching on YouTube. And uh, thank you again so much for your time too, Michael. I really appreciate it. And kudos to you as well and, and Diadem and the whole team for everything you guys have done. It's it's super impressive. And I had mentioned to, this to you off air when we talked earlier today, but I I think one of the coolest things about it is that you guys chose to compete in something where people thought you were kind of nuts to do it because it's there's really, really big players that you were competing against and going after, and you guys are continually taking the steps that you need to to, to go in the direction of, of competing against those big players and becoming that global brand that you talked about. And I, I just see you guys continuing to do that. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Brody. I appreciate the support, man. It's, uh, it's great to have guys like you on our team, and uh, we'll, we'll keep chipping away at it. 